Hello and welcome back. And this is the final week of our course. And this week we're going to discuss a concept we haven't looked at so far this semester. And that's the concept of culture. We're going to explore it in relation to what's called dual inheritance theory and look at some of the key concepts in dual inheritance theory, including complex cultural adaptations. And I also have a film for you to watch on traditional rice agriculture in Bali, which illustrates very well the idea of a complex cultural adaptation. And I hope you enjoy it. Uh, thanks for listening, and I thank you so much uh, for being in the course. I hope to see you around sometime. Hello, and this presentation is called, What is Dual Inheritance Theory? And as we discussed earlier in the semester, evolutionary anthropology is a bundle of competing approaches. So what we call evolutionary anthropology consists of evolutionary psychology as well as human behavioral ecology. And we've discussed each of these and compared them in prior presentations. We noted in those presentations that there's much that these approaches share, including a natural science model of inquiry based on that critical epistemology and a materialist ontology, and an evolutionary perspective, and the argument that evolutionary theory provides both a necessary and sufficient basis for explaining human behavior. So basically, uh, the argument here is that all we need is evolutionary theory as it's been developed in biology and we can explain human behavior. Now there's something else that evolutionary psychology and human behavioral ecology share, and this is in opposition to the social sciences and what's called the standard social science model. And in the standard social science model, the study of human behavior begins and ends with culture. And in this framework, Evolution has a very small role, which is why the word evolution is so small on the screen. So there's three basic themes in cultural theory. The first is that culture is extragenetic. It's not genetically transmitted. The second is that culture is uniquely human and no other organism has it. And the third is that culture is collective. It's a group thing. It transcends individuality and makes individual differences insignificant. And if we put these three basic themes in cultural theory together, they pretty much obscure evolution altogether. And this is why there's been such a conflict then between approaches that have tried to study human behavior in an evolutionary perspective and the social sciences. So in the standard social science model, culture marks the end of evolution. So evolution happens and then it hits a red light when culture begins and culture gets the green light. <clears throat> now it's certainly true that most social scientists uh, would agree that evolution matters for all living things that they'd exclude humans from that when it comes to explaining behavior. So we may need evolutionary models to explain the behavior of badgers and billy goats, but we don't need evolution to explain human behavior because culture explains that. And certainly even for humans, most social scientists would say, well, evolution mattered for humans, but it only mattered until culture evolved. And once culture evolves, uh, then we can ignore evolution because once again, all that we need to focus on is culture. So it's fair to say that through most of the 20th century, culture preempted discussion of the evolution of human behavior. Now, evolutionary psychologists and human behavioral ecologists returned the favor, 
And this means that as far as culture goes, it hits a red light, and evolution gets the green light. And what has happened in the last half century then is that evolution has preempted discussion of the role of culture in human behavior. We kind of have uh, alternate exclusions here with the social sciences excluding evolution and the evolutionary sciences excluding culture. But that's not entirely true and change seems to be in the air in recent years. For one, uh, one of the leading behavioral ecologists, Monique Bergerhoff Mulder, has argued quite recently in 2013 that human behavioral ecology is necessary but not sufficient for the evolutionary analysis of human behavior. So we have a necessary but not sufficient statement and what else is needed? She goes on to say that human and behavioral ecology has not addressed the elephant in the room and that elephant is cultural transmission. So there's a third contender. We have evolutionary psychology, human behavioral ecology. Now we're going to introduce dual inheritance theory or DIT, D-I-T. And in this approach, human evolution involves genes and culture, which is why it's called dual inheritance theory. If you're interested, we've given you a book to read on each of these perspectives, and the best book to read on dual inheritance theory is a book called Not by Genes Alone, How Culture Transformed Human Evolution by Peter Richardson and Robert Boyd. And there's a little photo of Pete Richardson. So a key point of agreement here is that the basic principles of evolutionary theory are necessary to explain human behavior. Dual inheritance theory doesn't push evolution out the door in bringing culture back in, and neither does it push genes out the door. So genes matter, but the key hypothesis of dual inheritance theory is that most behavioral variation between human groups is cultural, and in order to understand human behavior, we have to understand the role of culture in the evolutionary process uh, in the past and at present. So dual inheritance theory, again, is two distinct pathways of transmission, genes and culture interacting. That the focus is really, or has been, on cultural transmission. And social scientists have long argued that cultural transmission differs from genetic transmission, and there's basic agreement on three key differences. First is that genes have limited sources of information relative to culture. So here's the family tree of Queen Victoria. She has nine children uh, with one uh, husband, and then she has uh, her parents and her husband has his parents. But in each generation going down, there's just two sources of information. There's two parents, the egg and the sperm. That's in a sexually reproducing organism like humans. Culture, on the other hand, presumably has many more sources of information, whoever we learn from. And we could say, uh, to give this a pithy phrase, is that culture is more resourceful. One thing that culture does is it increases the range of information that's available to us that might influence our behavior. So we could compare uh, the family tree of Queen Victoria uh, to what's called the Mathematics Genealogy Project, where the top uh, mathematics advisor uh, C.C.J. Kuhl has uh, overseen the dissertations, the Ph.D. dissertations of 121 students. All right. And the second uh, most prolific advisor, Roger Tiemann, has overseen 112 students. And that's a lot of uh, cultural influence there. Now, there's a different way to look at this, though. And out of all the mathematicians that are counted in the database, uh, close to 140,000. Uh, what we'll learn here is that the overwhelming majority of mathematicians have never had a PhD student. 
So that's 136,689 mathematicians who are themselves uh, PhDs who have no PhD students. There's 17,691 mathematicians who've had only one student, 6,804 who've had two, and then 3,919 who've had three. So we see some real differential cultural reproductive success. This isn't about genetic reproduction, but cultural reproduction. And clearly, a variation in cultural reproduction can be quite extreme. Another uh, idea is that culture is more eventful. And what do we mean by this? Well, if we look at uh, genetic transmission, there's one transmission event. And that's when the egg hits the sperm. Um, that's the only point at which those two sources of information come together. If we look at cultural transmission, um, there's a multitude of transmission events. That might be every time that you go to class or watch a television show or listen to the song on the radio or visit with a friend uh, or send a text message. It's hard to know exactly how we would pinpoint what a transmission event is in terms of culture as precisely as we can with genes. But clearly cultural transmission can be relatively continuous. And that's what we mean by more eventful. And the last point is that genes and cultures change for different reasons. So this shows what's called a point mutation, an SNP. And what has happened is a single letter, as a single nucleotide, has been altered. And this is showing the chain of amino acids that make up a blood cell, a hemoglobin. And so what's happened is that the adenine has been changed to thymine. And as a result, instead of glutamic acid, we have valine. And that's right there at that point in the chain of amino acids that are coded for. That's called a point mutation. And that particular one is associated with sickle cell anemia. So that's one kind of mutation. Um, this is another kind of mutation, the change from the first Apple computer uh, to current Apple computers. Uh, there's a very rapid alteration in those, and all of this has happened, this technological development, without any uh, genetic change occurring. So this is the argument that what's going on in genetic mutations and cultural mutations is something quite different uh, with different potentials. So then we might say, okay, this sounds really familiar, so how does this possibly differ from the standard social science model. Aren't we just going back to it? Well, there are several things about dual inheritance theory that are different. And the first is that culture has only limited powers. So according to uh, the authors of Meeting at Grand Central, this is a nice expression of this. In some instances, culture shapes behavior in powerful ways. But in others, culture seems to influence behavior weakly or not at all. And so there's a recognition uh, that culture doesn't have unlimited power to influence human behavior, uh, but works within some corridors. This is like the separation of powers in American government. Culture is just one power and genes are another power. I don't know what the third one would be in this analogy, um, but culture is not all powerful. Another departure from the standard social science model is that humans are downgraded from uniqueness to simply distinctiveness. So the argument of Peter Richardson and Robert Boyd is that social transmission of behavior is common. And in fact, it's been documented in a multitude of species. Many evolutionary biologists like to talk about culture in guppies because there's learned behavior that varies between groups in guppies. Certainly, primatologists have identified socially transmitted variation in behavior in chimpanzees. So a couple of books you might be interested in if you're an aspiring primatologist. Uh, one is called Chimpanzee Cultures, and the other, The Culture Chimpanzee. And The Culture Chimpanzee introduces a field called cultural primatology,
which would uh, absorb then cultural anthropology and put the study of culture into a comparative primate perspective. But again, it presumably goes far beyond chimps. So this raises the question, well, if socially transmitted behavior is so common, uh, how is what humans do or how humans learn, how is this special? And the argument of uh, Richardson and Boyd is that only humans show much evidence of cumulative cultural evolution. And this means the ability to build on uh, cultural innovations as we see in the changes in computers and in cell phones and in software and in all of these other areas of human endeavor. A third argument uh, that differentiates uh, dual inheritance theory from some of the social science approaches is the argument that culture is adaptive. And that was actually a key argument in what's known as cultural materialism. But dual inheritance theorists have defined a concept that they call complex cultural adaptations. And this is the cumulative work of many minds over many generations. It might be something like a bow and arrow. It might be the way of building a kayak. Um, it could be a tradition of making music in particular ways, or it might be a language. So they argue that many aspects of culture can properly be called complex cultural adaptations. And what really defines them is that they exceed the creative capacity of single individuals. So if we didn't have this uh, uh, cumulative process going on, it would be impossible for one individual to reinvent all of these adaptations. Now an example of this, one example of these scrawls to the right, uh, that's some calculus problems. And although we say Leibniz and Newton came up with this, they had a lot of progenitors and they didn't quite have it worked out. So what we call calculus today has involved the labors of thousands of mathematicians clarifying their thinking and integrating it with new fields of mathematics. And it's certainly not something that we would expect any one individual to work out if it suddenly disappeared. Uh, just as impressive, these are Australian Aboriginal hunting boomerangs. And if uh, uh, there wasn't any calculus in Aboriginal Australia, the aerodynamics of these boomerangs uh, would have benefited from calculus. And uh, uh, this is arguably something that many individuals contributed to. There's a lot of individual variation in the style and kinds of boomerangs. Uh, but that's also arguably a complex cultural adaptation. And that's important because this represents a minor difference. Maybe it's not so minor between evolutionary psychology and dual inheritance theory. So evolutionary psychologists in crit criticizing the social science model argue that culture is simply what's evoked by our evolved psychology. So they downplay the significance of cumulative cultural transmission and traditions and argued instead that culture is something that flows out of those modules, out of the cognitive universals in our brain. And one of the key uh, cases behind this uh, was studies of human color perception. So it had long been argued uh, in the social sciences that humans cut the color spectrum up differently in different cultures, so that the way we see the world and classify it even in something so basic as color is culturally organized. Um, two anthropologists uh, showed that, in fact, uh, there's patterns in how languages have color terms. Some languages only have two terms, uh, light and dark. And in those languages, the speakers will identify black and white as the best examples of light and dark. If there's only three terms, that will include uh, white and black and red. If there's a fourth term in the language, it will be either green or yellow that's added. After uh, th those terms, if there's a sixth term, it's always blue. If there's a seventh, it's always brown. And then if there's an eighth, it might be uh, orange or purple or gray or pink. Um, but they showed that people tend to pick as the most salient example the same colors. Uh, 
and that the languages don't vary in ways that are completely arbitrary in their color terms, but they're structured by a universal human cognition. So that seemed to put the matter in place. Dual inheritance theorists, though, argue that these complex cultural adaptations are patterns of cultural knowledge that cannot be evoked by one brain. And an example that you're going to be watching a film about are Balinese rice terraces and the whole complex that goes with that, including a system of water temples. And that this is something that's uh, been built uh, through the thinking of multitudes of people rather than one. And if it suddenly went away, it would be unlikely uh, to be evoked uh, by one brain. So this is an important contrast. Um, but lastly, uh, going back to how dual inheritance theory differs from the standard social science model, dual inheritance theory focuses on how culture evolved and continues to evolve. So a couple of questions that they're interested in is how might cumulative cultural learning and complex cultural adaptations have been selected for in the first place? Uh, this is a problem similar to how cooperation and altruism evolve, and they approach it uh, using mathematical models. A second question that they've tackled is why do human societies exhibit cultural differences uh, both between groups and within groups? Um, why is there variation in cultural knowledge within groups, and why do we see these differences between them? And they've developed models about how we imitate other people and how a culture spreads. And again, these are mathematical models um, that simplify reality and allow certain insights. So they call these models uh, bias transmission models. And we're just going to look at a few. But the idea here is that when we're learning, we have limited time and also limited energy. So the question here is, why are you putting this effort into learning evolutionary anthropology? Um, you could be learning something else, right? Why do we choose to invest our efforts learning what we do? And what's going on with that? Um, how do we decide what to learn and what to ignore? When do we simply try to copy somebody else's work rather than doing our own work? And among the models they've developed, one is called conformist transmission. And put in plain English, this means that you simply imitate what's most common in your group. And this is really evident. Uh, it's been demonstrated for a long time by social psychologists. Um, it's evident to me in small group activities that different small groups tend to fall into conformist patterns. And they differ from each other at a group level. Another kind of bias is content determined. And this might be that you try to learn whatever's easiest. So given a variety of possibilities, you go with the easiest approach. And in that case, you're looking at the character of the content uh, to decide what to learn. Maybe you took anthropology because you thought it was easier than other uh, courses in the sciences. Right? A third uh, model that they have, a bias transmission, is based on status. And the idea here is that you do what the successful people or the cool people are doing. You do whatever uh, seems to uh, bring success to people and popularity. And maybe you're taking anthropology because it's so popular. <laughs> so... These are interesting uh, questions. If you're interested in learning more about this, again, the key book to start with, uh, it's written in plain English, is uh, called Not by Genes Alone by Peter Richardson and Robert Boyd. So thank you for listening.